Hello and welcome. I am Kevin from the Assessment Committee, and today we're going to be talking about best practices of assessment. Just to set us up as an introduction, we're only going to focus on three types for this video, including general education, career programs, annual outcomes assessment, and also the three to five year program reviews. But when you look on our website, which I'll show you in a little bit, you'll see that we do all types of assessment within the college. Uh, for the purposes of institutional use and for accreditation. Uh, we have supportive services assessment, then we look at accessibility and disability services, career and job services, health and wellness, library, tutoring, advising, financial aid, IT, records and registration, and veterans, to name a few. We also measure co-curricular education, including athletics, student orientation, student clubs and organizations, and work experience. And we look at student perceptions, such as engagement and uh, student uh, and satisfaction. And you guys probably get emails for a lot of these. And that's, you know, this is where this is all coming from. So for the couple of main types, the first one we're going to talk about is the general education assessment. And this one, Edison State College is committed to ongoing outcomes assessment for continuous improvement of student learning and teaching strategies. Again, the goal of our general education assessment is not to necessarily measure performance. We're really looking at whether they're learning, learning outcomes. So the assessment process allows for faculty to explore ways to continually improve student learning, also course design and the effectiveness of programs along with overall teaching and learning. Unlike evaluation, which looks at mastery of content, assessment looks at, again, the process of learning. We're not measuring the teachers and how well they're doing. We're measuring how well the students are learning. And again, this is a state mandate. Assessment should enhance learning and should reflect the outcomes, purpose, and direction of learning design. And so all the multiple forms of assessment, we put all this together. We look at the programs, we look at the CAT classes, the curriculum, student learning, student outcome. That gives us a big picture of not only student performance, but also student learning and whether we are improving over time. The big other picture of this is that assessment also provides the means for transformative learning by providing relevant, clear, and timely feedback to HLC, our Higher Learning Commission, our creditors, and that is incredibly important, which is why we need this data, we need to go in an assessment. But we also wanna look at other factors such as students and also be accountable to our stakeholders. Now. We do have state mandated assessments, things that we need to look at, but we can be incredibly broad as a college and we could look at anything we want. And so we have made decisions to look at, again, the main ones, supportive services, co-curricular education, student perceptions of engagement and satisfaction, along with general education, career programs, and three to five year program reviews. This is the big core of it all. But that doesn't mean we can't go beyond this and assess all the little aspects of anything that is happening at our college. So if there's ever any ideas or things that you would like to see assessed or things that we can improve, do not hesitate to bring that to the table. Whenever we go to the conferences, it's incredible to hear the diversity of which topics are being assessed at different colleges. Like we don't necessarily have the fraternities and sororities at our school, but there's entire types of assessment that's just directed at looking at those programs, for example. So again, assessment can be broad, but these that you see here on our screen are the big ones we do at Edison State. And these three bottom ones are the ones we're gonna focus on today. And again, the first one we're talking about is general education assessment. The outcomes for general education assessment, they are to improve student academic achievement, improve teaching strategies, best practices, identifying opportunities for systemic improvements, and to provide evidence for institutional effectiveness, which we have to have for the accreditation, but we also want that for ourselves so we can look at ourselves to see how can we do better as a team and work forward to the future. Now, here are the state mandates. And again, this is just pulled directly out of the assessment manual, which I will show you guys. We have to assess critical thinking, and it's defined long version as uh, with the students having to demonstrate critical thinking skills in order to understand complex relationships, to evaluate claims of truth, aesthetic value, ethics, and morality, 
and to make appropriate choices and draw defensible conclusions. This is what the state wants us to look at. So we have created a rubric for critical thinking. We also are gonna look at oral communication defined by the state as use written and spoken English effectively and free exchange of ideas. Mathematics, appreciate the process and structure of mathematics and apply math to the analysis of the physical world. Not every class is accessible for mathematics, but we can assess mathematics class. Not every class might be suitable for this critical thinking, but we can identify the classes which are suitable for critical thinking. And we have sent out emails and uh, questionnaires to ask of these items, which of these fit in your class? And so we have identified those and we will continue to identify which classes are most suitable to evaluate the state mandates. But these are the ones that we have to evaluate and we've selected courses to evaluate these not every course can be evaluated for diversity. But we have several classes at Edison that can be used for diversity. Those classes have been identified. We built a rubric to figure out how to measure it. And what we're supposed to be measuring according to the state is, are students developing a mental habit which is open-minded, tolerant, appreciative of diversity, and aware of global cultures? The state wants us to evaluate that. It doesn't tell us specifically how to evaluate that. We as an assessment committee, along with the other departments at the school, have worked on rubrics and evaluated measure or developed measures by which we can evaluate diversity at Edison State, but not every class is capable of that. Again, we also measure interpersonal skills and teamwork. This in involves developing effective interpersonal skills, such as working in groups as a team. And when we send out the rubrics, we have specific areas that we want to look at, which we'll show you shortly in another video too, is when we go real deep, but I'll give you an example of this one. And we also are going to measure inquiry, use information resources and apply basic methods of inquiry from many fields, including scientific method, social and scientific observation, cause effect analysis, and artistic criticism. Okay. And so this is what we have the, these are the core components of what we are in assessment measuring for general education outcomes, okay? And again, as I've said, not every class is capable of having an assignment that can be measured to evaluate student learning in these areas over time. However, of the courses that it does work for, we can evaluate these. And so the next question, of course, is, okay, this is what the state says we have to do. How do we evaluate it? And again, we built a rubric as a team. We then send that out. We gather up the data and then we assess it, put it all together in a nice pretty package, develop an action plan, implement the action plan, and then assess again. So again, therefore, this is how we measure these items that we just discussed, oral communication, written communication, critical thinking, inquiry, diversity, interpersonal skills and teamwork, and mathematics. And again, I know it's a, a lot at first because you're like, what is all of this? Again, what we assess are these state mandates. And so how do we assess these state mandates? We have created a schedule to assess it. So coming up for the 2023 fall semester, for example, we could, we're going to be assessing oral communication, reinforcing our action plan of written communication. Same thing with critical thinking. We're going to be taking our action plan for inquiry and we're going to be implementing that. For diversity, we're going to be deciding how we're going to improve that and creating the action plan. And then we're going to be reviewing interpersonal skills and teamwork. And then we're going to be assessing mathematics. And again, this is just our schedule. You guys don't have to, you know, think about when this needs done until we send it out the email that says, hey, here's your rubrics, the students that have been identified for evaluation. These need turned in at a specific time. And then the instructions of how to submit it are included. Um, and so this is the goal. If we do this in this schedule, it means that we are following the state requirements of assessing general education. And again, how we assess each class, as you guys walk down the line, you can see this circle. First, we're going to assess it. So, and then we're going to review our data. 
And then we're gonna come up with our action plan. Then we're gonna implement our action plan. Then we're gonna go back and ask are our outcomes being effective? How can we reinforce this to get positive outcomes? And then again, we'll reassess and compare and contrast from prior years and see where we're at. Are we improving? Are we declining? Are we just great? We're rocking it. We're staying even, rocking it. And so we can come to these interpretations after we evaluate. So some basic terminology for assessment. Again, assessment is defined as the systematic collection, review, and use of information about educational programs undertaken for the purpose of improving student learning and development. No, it's not about measuring student performance. It is about measuring student learning. And we're not measuring the teachers either. It's not a grade for you at all whatsoever. All we care about is student learning because we want to create the best learning environment where their brains are just rocking it with so much information. And we're all walking around at school feeling good about ourselves because we know our students are growing and learning and getting smarter. And we're so proud of them. OK, so that's the goal of all of this. So, yes, that's why we care that we get good data and we get good responses on all of these items. A rubric, as I've mentioned, is a scoring key. We use them in many classes. I'm assuming you've come across the rubric at some point. Um, but again, it's a scoring key used. Uh, that's a grid that outlines identified criteria for successfully completing an assignment or task and establishes levels for meeting those criteria. The rubric is the simplest and most efficient way to collect complicated data. This is just pulled straight out of you know, the assessment book. Sampling. So how do we go about our sample? We'll talk about next, but just to introduce it. Sampling is the method by which we obtain information about characteristics of a population by examining a smaller randomly chosen selection, the sample of group members. I usually just think of a sample as a small part of a population, easiest way for me. And then an artifact. When we're mentioning artifacts, this is the actual assignment we're gonna use to evaluate student learning. In my classes, I usually will use, uh, you know, a, a very in-depth uh, assignment as, as whenever that is possible that meets the criteria of the rubric or meets the criteria of what is to be assessed for that semester. And so when you're thinking of the word artifact, that's the assignment. You're going to be evaluating learning outcomes based upon that assignment. Okay, so artifacts are defined as physical or digital evidence, like an assignment of learning that students produce during their studies. They are typically used in higher learning institutes to demonstrate a student's achievement and mastery of the course learning objectives. Artifacts can take various forms, including papers, presentations, projects, research posters, videos, and even social media posts. Again, I usually will try to use like a final project if that's ideal because it's so fluid. Um, but you know, you have to ask which artifact or which assignment or which project works the best in your class to evaluate what we need to when it comes to the big ones we've mentioned, which again are oral communication. So you want to ask yourself when you're looking for an artifact, which assignment or project or group work or whatever meets oral communication or written communication. Like written communication in my classes is so easy because they write so much. Every assignment could pretty much use, but again, I try to use the most in-depth one, like a final project. In that final project, they also have to use oral communication to be able to uh, present. They have to record a video and use their voice and do PowerPoints. I also use interpersonal in those final projects because they have to do discussions where they're interacting with each other and having to reply and listen to each other's work and give critical feedback. Critical thinking works for that because they're also having to give feedback, but they're also having to do big, big projects. And then, you know, so again, you just got to think, do I have something in my class that would meet this rubric? What's the best thing for it? And then again, we'll occasionally send out emails do you have uh, classes that would meet this criteria we could use for assessment? And then you want to give us the feedback back so we can, you know, have a great inclusive set of classes that we use for these specific types of items that we are going to be assessing for that specific mm -hmm. semester. Okay. So here's an example of a general education rubric. Okay. Uh, here's just a critical thinking one, for example. And again, the state simply says, let me show you again, we have to 
demonstrate critical thinking skills in order to understand complex relationships, evaluate claims of truth, aesthetic value, ethics, and morality to make appropriate choices and draw defensible conclusions. This rubric is how we, as an assessment committee, along with working with other departments, have decided it's best to evaluate that. Okay, so we broke it down into demonstrates the ability to identify and define a problem or a question to be addressed, clearly communicates perspective, hypothesis, position, presents, assesses, and analyzes data using uh, supporting evidence, identifies and assesses the key assumptions, positions, and biases of self and others, and then articulates conclusions, com implications, um, implementations, and or consequences clearly. So we as a committee got together and decided what's the best way to evaluate critical thinking skills. This is what we came up with. We always go back to these, update them, ask if they're valid and reliable. So we're constantly addressing this, which is good. We have to keep up on that. But here's an example of that. Here's another example for what we're gonna talk about next, but career program assessment. Here's another rubric we use to go through and evaluate learning outcomes. Um, not everyone gets one of these. Generally, it's the person that is teaching the class or the head of the department. So not everyone's going to see one of these, just like you're not always going to see a critical thinking uh, request from assessment or a mathematics request from assessment. Because if I don't teach mathematics, they'll never ask me to do this assessment but I might see diversity, critical thinking, oral communication, written communication, et cetera. Some other people are gonna see something called a career program assessment. And this is how we evaluate that. We break out the program and then we have outside people evaluate people's learning outcomes. They then fill in all these categories. And then we as a committee just work with the instructors to develop an action plan to decide if we need to make any changes or improvements, et cetera. Um, and I'll talk about that next. Uh, but really quick, how do we pick our sample? Student rosters are pulled for all classes that had that area identified as accessible. And this is what I've been discussing this whole time. Not every class is accessible for mathematics but we have gone through and identified the classes that we think are, or the instructor said that they are, and we've then verified that with the team. And then those are the classes that we send out. Of those classes, the students in that classes become part of the population that we are going to sample, okay? So student rosters are pulled for all classes that had that area identified as accessible. Again, so the list is unduplicated to ensure the same student isn't assessed more than once. Because again, if you have a person in your psychology class and your sociology class and they're constantly being uh, evaluated, then you don't have the duplicate results. So we don't want that. Uh, remaining rosters using a random selection process are reduced to no more than 10 students per faculty to make it convenient for you guys. So you're not having to evaluate 100 people per class. Um, the goal is to have seven or less students per faculty member again, and no more than 10. Same thing goes for full-time adjuncts and CCP instructors. And again, what do we do with the data? The assessment committee that we pull for all of this will create an action plan. The action plans, again, are meant to improve student learning and development at, at Edison. And then there's this link, and this is what I wanna show you guys. You can, uh, if you just go to Edison's assessment page here, this, is what we do with the data, okay? First and foremost, I wanna bring the attention to the assessment handbook. Here's all of us that are on the team. And again, it's always in flux depending on uh, term limits and things along those lines. Here is the assessment handbook, okay? So when you click on the assessment handbook, here is the handbook. If you guys just take a chance, make sure you scroll through this, it gets into uh, the state requirements, again, the board requirements. Down here are examples uh, for all of the, uh, the different rubrics. So here's inquiry, diversity, all of it's here. I'm not gonna you know, spend a whole lot of time in this video talking about that, but please check that out. But then on the website, again, if you wanna see our data, it's all in here. You can see our reports, 
So please check out our general education reports. Here's our career program outcomes that I'm gonna talk about next. Here's that. Program reviews. You have to access the SharePoint or data request form to get those unless you're a part of it. Here is your report for assessment of supportive services, co-curricular education, student perceptions and satisfaction. So please, if you get a chance, make sure you guys check that out. All right. So the next type of assessment that we do under main he headings, we just talked about general education. This one I'm not going to spend as much time on because not everyone's involved in this. But uh, this is important that you guys are aware that this can be potential if you're the head of the department or teaching in that department. We do career program annual outcomes assessment, okay? So for this, career programs and transfer degree programs develop outcomes that describe the general goals that that program emphasizes. And when I showed you guys the rubric, these are the goals. We have it all broken down, okay? Faculty members in each program area develop an outcome assessment procedure. Many career programs require students to take a capstone course or participate in an internship. Portfolio reviews, reports from internship supervisors, reviews of projects from capstone courses, and work samples taken from selected courses are commonly used as the basis for an annual assessment. And not every type of class or field or the program or department gets evaluated. Again, it's career technical. Okay, career program annual outcomes, the capstone and the internship programs. Okay, uh, outside professionals are used to assess the quality of students work using a rubric, like I showed you, designed to gather information related to program outcomes. If you wanna see completed rubrics, please look at the handbook that I just pulled up on the bottom, like page uh, 47 is where you can see all of the uh, finished completed ones uh, around that area. The rubric includes a rating scale, preferably one to five, or with descriptors such as superior, above average, average, below average, and does not meet the requirements. Using the information provided by the assessors, the program's faculty members prepare the annual outcomes assessment report, and that's what is posted on that website that describes the student's achievement of each of those outcomes. So again, please look at our data. It's your best friend. It shows you why we do this and what we're coming up with and what we're learning from our, our assessing. Based on this report, um, oh, I'm sorry, using the information provided by the assessors, the program faculty members prepare the annual, oh, never mind, I did that, <laughs> sorry. I'm reading through this just so you guys get all the main data. There's just so many words that I just figured I'd copy it like this for your fun. Based on this report, the faculty members will propose changes to improve the program. During the next academic year's program assessment, the faculty members will determine whether improvement related from these changes, again, our action plan, this information will also be included in the program's annual assessment report. So again, we go through and we get the outside evaluators to fill out uh, the data sheet, the rubric, and evaluate basically how we're doing. And then we take that data and we bring it to the faculty responsible and we review that data with the faculty. The faculty and the deans and the provost work together to create an action plan. And then we go back and evaluate whether our, our improvements or implementations from the action plan were successful. And so again, this is the long way to say all of that, but you know, I think it's important that you guys get some of this information, even if it's a little too much at times, okay. <laughs> The final one I'm gonna talk about is the three to five year program reviews. Again, so you, a program review committee will be identified by the program faculty and the dean of the division to perform the review of the program. So not everyone's gonna be responsible for this and not everyone's gonna see this. Most of you will see a general education rubric at, at some point. Not all of you will see a career program evaluation every year. And not all of you will see a three to five year program review, but many of you will. That's why it's important to talk about this, okay? So I broke it down into faculty responsibilities and uh, dean and provost responsibilities. But just to give you a quick introduction, the faculty who teach in the program will collect and organize the program materials that will be reviewed by the committee. This may include, but is not limited to. So this is what you'll have to gather up should you ever be in this position where we're going to be assessing a program. We need the college mission statement, catalog, program outcomes, staffing information, your syllabi from the last several years, 
handouts, requirements of accrediting bodies. So we got to look at the accreditation and make sure we're meeting it. Recommendations of professional organizations, outcomes assessments, and the last program review report. Again, we're always looking back in the past to see how we're doing in the present to see how we can do better in the future. The dean and program faculty members will prepare statements or reports to be included in the summary report prepared by the Office of Institutional Planning, Effectiveness, and Accreditation that may address the following. Accreditation status, are we good? <laughs> this is why we're doing assessment, to make sure we're good. Articulation agreements, are we you know, complying with those? External evaluation methods, recruitment efforts, and unique value to the college. The dean and provost responsibilities for faculty evaluation. The provost and the dean supervising the program will review the program review report. They will then meet to review the program statistics, which they consider appropriate. These statistics may include, but are not limited to, success of students in individual courses, completion rates for students entering the program, number of students who are majoring in the program, number of FTEs generated by the program, and number of graduates in the year since the last program review, staffing information concerning the program, financial information concerning the program, any surveys or other data that they consider important. This meeting should address two questions. Do the program statistics show any trends that need to be addressed? Again, after we evaluate, what do we see? Are we good? Can we do better? Do we need to do better because we're not doing great? And then should the program be continued or should it be eliminated? Is it still useful? Are we doing a good job at it? Do we have enough students enrolling in it? How well are they doing at it? Are we achieving our goals? Many questions that have to be asked. Again, that's the purpose of assessment is to look at all the aspects of the college and ask the right questions and then have like a, a way of measuring that, not just statistically, but also qualitatively. So it's good to have, you know, the assessment in place. And we appreciate everyone's help on this so much because without you helping us gather the data, there is no way that we can ever do the fun analysis. <laughs> yes, we live for analysis and assessment. The development of an action plan. And again, what good is data if we're not going to do anything about it? And especially if we're not even going to bother to review it and to come up with some good common themes or some good main points. So again, as we discussed in our assessment cycle, we let's just go back to that slide really quick so we can talk about our action plan. We first, we're going to assess whether it's general education, career programs, or overall programs. Then we're gonna review our data and we're gonna ask, what's up? How are we doing? And then we're gonna create that action plan. That's how we improve. And then we implement it, okay? And then we evaluate whether or not our outcomes are successful. If they are, keep reinforcing it. If they're not, add some more reinforcement, whatever we can do to make it better. So again, when we're looking at development of an action plan. This is very important. Not only that we create one, that we implement it, but we also evaluate whether or not we are successful in the, uh, in the implementation of the action plan. So the provost, the dean in charge of the program, the program coordinator, faculty member in charge of the program, and the faculty member who wrote the program review report. Again, many people could be involved in this. That's why we're talking about it today. They then meet. They get together as a committee and hang out and discuss it and work through this and figure it out. It's awesome, that's the best way to do it. They will discuss the report and the answers again to the two questions that we just discussed, which are any trends that need to be addressed and two, should the program be continued or eliminated? Why or why not? They will develop an action plan for the program if it's gonna be continued. A copy of the report and action plan along with the answers to the two questions above will be sent to the Office of Institutional Planning, Effectiveness, and Accreditation for archiving. The action plan will then become part of the annual outcomes assessment review for implementation and updates. And again, please check out the websites for all of our uh, presentations. There's some great data in there and some good analysis. Okay. Thank you very much for coming today, and I appreciate your time.